I am really happy to be here and talking with you. We've done a lot of collaboration with pediatrics over the years through our whole team, and we're really excited about the resilience curriculum that Dr. Lloyd and Birch are leading. I'm, I'm going to talk really about three areas today. One is really getting us to think about the comorbidity of behavioral health problems in both primary care and chronic, chronic pediatric settings, as well as to more specifically look at medical trauma. I know you all had a wonderful lecture on that last year, but I'm just going to briefly review it because it's really relevant to the family resilience model that we've built that incorporates interventions for traumatic stress. And then I'm going to lay the background for the role of family-centered prevention and care in pediatric settings, as well as in community settings, and share with you a little bit about the focus model that um, was just uh, overviewed a bit, and then talk about how we've brought some of the lessons learned with the scaling that we did in military populations back to UCLA. And I'll be speaking about the uh, collaborative care model that Dr. Grossman has set up in Behavioral Health Associates, as well as some of the work we've done with STAR. So first, what's the UCLA Nathanson Family Resilience Center? This is really a group of researchers, providers, trainers, technology folks who've come together to really think about how we uh, can advance family resilience and family prevention practices across a range of settings, child welfare, juvenile justice, school-based care, uh, military communities, as well as healthcare settings. And we have, our team really works together uh, for all the way from programmers to methodologists uh, to clinicians to do this work. So just, to, just as a background, I want to speak about the prevalence of child and adolescent behavioral health problems in primary care. You all are on the front lines. You know better than anybody that a, a fair percentage of kids and families coming into clinics uh, have a, a, a comorbid or, or actually a primarily dose, uh, diagnosed behavioral health disorder, which includes about 13 to 20 percent of kids in a primary care population. These kids are high utilizers of health care services. Uh, they tend to come more for both well-child checks, but also outpatient concerns and ER visits. And this has been shown across a range of settings. It's also important to note that suicide is the third leading cause of mortality in 10 to 14 year olds and the second in 15 to 18 year olds. Really, um, I think calling attention to the need to be doing behavioral health screening in primary care settings. And I know we're moving in that direction, even within our own healthcare system. What about when a kid has a chronic illness? Well, we know that rates of mental health disorders are up to four times greater in kids with chronic medical illnesses. This often takes the form of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress, which I'll talk a bit more about. We know that when mental health symptoms are, go untreated in kids, they have a significant impact on quality of life, their academic functioning, as well as their adherence to uh, medical treatment regimens. They, th these are kids who have difficulty with adherence. Um, these are the kids in a heart transplant clinic uh, who are more at risk for uh, uh, problematic outcomes. So what is pediatric uh, medical traumatic stress? Well, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network uh, defines it as a set of psychological and physiological responses of children and their family to pain, injury, serious illness, medical procedures, and invasive or frightening treatment experiences. And this has really been a, a primary focus of uh, a, number of groups across the country over the last 10 years, bringing more attention to uh, now this well-documented set of uh, problems related to 
what, what are necessary medical treatments, um, all the way from a diagnosis to uh, long-term care. And a lot of the wor early work was done in pediatric oncology, but has been done across a number of diagnoses, and I'll show you. And it's, it's important that these kids don't often meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, but have significant symptoms which impair their functioning. And we'll see from the data I'm about to present that it's not only them, but it's their family members and the, the best studied are parents who are affected as well. So, you know, as I said, all the way from receiving a life-threatening diagnosis to undergoing painful or distressing procedures to coping with complex medical technology, kids in, in the PICU, uh, as well as just being separated from a, a family member are all risk factors for medical traumatic stress. A lot of the kids that we work with have also been exposed to a friend's medical treatment as well as potentially the loss of a friend. You know, a lot of our kids uh, go to camps, become really close to kids while they're in the hospital, and when losses occur, that effect ripples across the whole community, both to the child and to other parents as well. So these are some of the data looking at uh, PTSD uh, symptoms in both patients and parents across a range of diagnoses. And you'll see, and uh, this is always remarkable to me, that parents are, uh, have just as high screening rates for post-traumatic stress as patients do in almost every setting and in some cases higher. And that's true for long-term cancer survivors as well, as you can see that uh, 20 to 43 percent of parents screen at risk for post-traumatic stress uh, in uh, childhood cancer survivors. This is the typical trajectory of post-traumatic stress symptoms. This trajectory looks the same across a range of traumas, not only medical events. Uh, is there's, huh, there's an acute event. Uh, many people have uh, immediate reactions that are consistent with acute stress reactions. And then after uh, between one and six months, most people in the population uh, go back to their baseline level of functioning. But there are those uh, pro in, in across a range of different traumas and, and uh, studies in big population samples, between 12 and 20 percent go on to have more persistent post-traumatic stress symptoms. <laughs> this is a study with over 6,000 childhood cancer survivors uh, following them out um, to uh, adulthood. And you can see that with a mean age of 32, years later, 9% met criteria for PTSD. And 24% and almost had significant post-traumatic stress symptoms. I think it's important that even when you're not meet, meeting the threshold for a full diagnosis, that the presence of those symptoms can really interfere with a whole host of uh, life functioning, particularly your interpersonal relationships. We view post-traumatic stress as an interpersonal disorder. It affects um, how, your parent-child relationships, relationships with your romantic partner, and really can be quite impairing. So what are the key risk factors? Uh, uh, Dr. Ann Kazak at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia has done a lot of this work with kids uh, who were acutely injured, but it's been replicated with pediatric cancer patients as well. Some of the, some of the salient predictors of those kids who go on to have post-traumatic stress, and actually family members too, uh, it's these are things you might expect and turn out to be true, the extent of exposure to the traumatic event, so how proximal were you to the event, um, how intense was it, were you injured during the event, did you have some degree of pain experience during the illness or injury, and then also were you separated from your parent. 
This is really critical, uh, and particularly in uh, evacuations or uh, when when an ambulance comes and takes a child to a children's center and a parent to a, an adult center, that not having your primary caregiver with you puts you at risk for later problematic functioning. Did you think you were going to die, and did your parent think you were going to die? These are, these are the kinds of things that uh, pop out in study after study, as well well as your underlying um, risk. Did you have prior traumatic events? We know um, in numerous settings, and um, many of you may be familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACEs study, that you know more a pylon of more trauma accumulates and puts you more at risk for both health and mental health problems later in life. And did you have prior emotional or behavioral problems? Kids with developmental risk um, tend to be more at risk for going on to having PTSD symptoms. So what does the research show about parenting? We know that parents' uh, availability and their capacity to function during the uh, a medical illness or injury um, has a key influence on how kids cope. Uh, if a, a parent is suffering from depression, anxiety, or PTSD, it can really have an impact on the, both the parent-child relationship, but also on the child's outcomes. And uh, some of the studies that have been done to tease apart, what are the aspects of parental functioning related to trauma that are particularly impairing? And it appears that uh, parent numbing and avoidance, withdrawal, withdrawal from the relationship are most, uh, most implicated in kids having difficulty. So I would say that, the, um, and I, I don't have time to present all the research in this area across all the different relational structures, but it would, as a whole, it suggests that practices that include parents, siblings, and the child um, are highly relevant to kids facing medical traumatic stress, but also just uh, even if they don't have PTSD symptoms, to, to have a family-centered approach to strengthening the family to prevent behavioral health problems is quite critical. A slide with a lot of words on it. Uh, Family-centered models are really uh, supported by now several decades of work across a variety of literatures, developmental psychopathology, attachment research, family systems research, life course research. To some extent, they all converge and was, uh, you know, recently been described as a family, as a developmental systems framework. And, and that what they show us is that kids really live in larger ecologies. The primary ecology is the family, but the family is surrounded by community, by school, uh, by their spiritual community, et cetera. And that those, all of those um, networks have an influence on the child's well-being. One of the best studied and best understood is that system which is most proximal, which is the family. And, and really, over and over again, the family members functioning, uh, parenting, positive parenting practices, marital relationships have an influence on ch child well-being. We also have seen from the family prevention science research that family prevention works. It works for kids who have a depressed parent, for kids facing divorce, for families facing significant loss, uh, families coping with HIV illness. There's just now a quite a well-established track record of interventions that um, focus on the family level at supporting positive parenting practices, uh, at enhancing and strengthening attachment relationships, at building skills across the family system are quite powerful, not just in the short term, but also in preventing uh, mental health problems and improving developmental outcomes uh, over 10 years, 15 years of follow-up. So this is a visual of what I just described. Um, I, I like 
uh, pictures, and I think this helps think about where you can start to strengthen and tie uh, the, the relationships between these services together. We live in a world where typically these things are quite siloed. Uh, there is a lot of effort now to try to integrate uh, the, the systems both at a school level, LA Unified has a uh, network of family wellness clinics, for instance, uh, obviously creating medical homes, embedding behavioral health and healthcare systems. These start to tie and strengthen the relationships between the systems that surround kids. So I know pediatrics uh, has been uh, at the forefront of really defining uh, family-centered care principles. Uh, these have been called out in the patient-centered care IOM report from 2001 that a big piece of patient-centered care is family-centered care. So I like to think of them as the same thing, that if we're truly patient-centered, we're inclusive of our patients' caregivers. And I would suggest this is true in a very obvious way in pediatrics, but it's also probably true in, uh, in adult medical settings as well. But families are less uh, included, less attended to, environments are not set up uh, to really strengthen them. So I think pediatrics has really led the way with attention to these principles. But really it's that your collaboration is with the parent, is with the patient and the family members, that families are central to child participation and treatment and have an influence over um, uh, their engagement and um, also their, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I lost my way, that they're really essential members of the caregiving team. So in pediatric healthcare settings, and this really is a, a, a summary slide of what I just described, that we really have an opportunity not only just to have be collaborative with parents um, to do preventive interventions, but we also have an opportunity to really actively screen and engage them uh, in integrated behavioral health. And this is what I want to focus on today. So just a brief overview of resilience. Uh, uh, people are keen on the concept of resilience now. I think one of the best definitions comes out of Ann Maston's work, which is the capacity of a dynamic system to withstand or recover from significant challenges that threaten its stability, viability, or development. So she, she would suggest that each level of that uh, ecological framework is a system. There's the system within the child, the family system, community, healthcare systems around it. And so each one plays a part, and there are interventions that can be done within each system. Um, I want to focus particularly on family resilience processes. Uh, what we've identified in resilient families are that families are able to openly communicate that there is a clarity about family roles and responsibilities, that families who are able to engage in effective problem solving and have a sense of cohesiveness, all of these predict resilient responses both in the family and the child. And there's another piece uh, that has been consistently identified in families who are able to cope with stress or threat in a resilience way, and that's their capacity to make shared meaning out of their experience. So we're going to look at that a bit. And a lot of this work comes from Froma Walsh's uh, wonderful book on family resilience. I'm going to talk about how we've taken these pieces and put them together to develop the FOCUS intervention. Uh, FOCUS is a resilience enhancing intervention that was specifically designed for kids facing adversity. We actually developed it first with medically ill pediatric populations, uh, but then had the opportunity to adapt it for military kids and families early in the war. Um, and because of that, adaptation uh, focus was selected to scale for military populations more broadly, including the Marines, Navy SEALs, uh, and some Army and Air Force. So we've been doing that work for about eight years, so I'll share with you a little bit of that experience. But really, FOCUS is meant to integrate the core elements from 
our existing evidence-based practices, and we, we um, sat down and mapped out core elements from two well-established interventions, both Mary Jane Rothram's work with families facing HIV and uh, Dr. Bill Beardsley's work uh, with families facing parental depression, as well as integrating with some post-traumatic stress interventions uh, that taught people skills about how to manage uh, traumatic reminders. And really integrated that with the family resilience research and developmental systems research to uh, think about strengthening families across those con uh, contexts in a very active way. Uh, to date, our, our intervention has served over 600,000 folks. Uh, going through the multi-session uh, intervention I'll show you have been about 10,000 adults and almost 9,000 kids who've participated. And we've published on this work in a new uh, set of uh, publications over the last four or five years. We've adapted it for couples who don't have kids or maybe pregnant and thinking about having kids, those with very young children, and those with physical injuries. This is the model that I'm talking about. It's a skills-based psychoeducational model that can be done in a non-clinical framework or integrated into a variety of settings, whether school or healthcare. We really regard the, the parents as family leaders. And in their first two sh sessions, they build a family narrative. And I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, they also uh, learn skills in specific psychoeducation related to the stressor that they're facing. Kids do the same thing in a developmentally appropriate way. So kids, younger kids build a time map. Uh, and then we go back to the parents and we prepare them to lead family sessions. So they're really, uh, we're there, but the provider is meant to facilitate their leadership of these sessions. And so the parenting session is really reviewing the skills, uh, maybe sharing pieces of the child's story that we know will be difficult for the parents or to respond to so that they can feel really well prepared and equipped to answer challenging questions. Uh, questions about life and death, questions about why they did something that they did, why did, you know, why did they leave the hospital when they did, uh, why weren't they there when the child needed them, or you know, for a child who's coping with a chronic illness, am I gonna die? So these are hard questions for parents to answer and they really need time to do specific preparation so that when they come to the family sessions and develop a shared family narrative, they really feel equipped to do so. These are the core elements. You can see the, um, we do a screening, and this is something I'm gonna uh, spend some time on because I think it's a critical part of the intervention to identify risks, not just in the child, but in all the family system, both parents and siblings. And I'll show you how we're doing that now here at UCLA. Uh, it helps personalize the care and shapes the interventions that we do. And then we do developmental, developmental guidance with the parents that's really customized to the specific issue that they're facing. So if their kid's in a heart transplant clinic, the provider needs to be knowledgeable about the key stressors and challenges, um, as well as have illness-specific information. So it's collaborating with the medical team. The family builds a narrative timeline, and this is some of the work that we're going to be doing with the pediatric residents. They're going to build their own narrative timeline to reflect on their experience, to really be able to uh, look at the ups and downs, to identify uh, areas of strengths, but also areas of difficulty, and to be able to communicate it and share it to another person. In families who've gone through trauma or a difficult medical diagnosis, we find that there are many things that they've never spoken about that, they're, that really drive them apart because they feel stuck and isolated, uh, kind of trying to manage themselves. Families really, kids don't want to worry parents with, their, with feeling afraid. 
Uh, they know they're, they're very, quite intuitive. They know their parents are distressed. Parents feel like they don't know how to talk to children about specific topics. And so this is an opportunity to reflect on that um, and to really start to develop some key skills. And these are key skills consistent with a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy practices, developing good emotional regulation. I'll show you a teeny bit about that. Um, problem solving skills, effective communication, being able to set goals as an individual and a family. and. <laughs> You don't manage deployment reminders, I'm sorry. And manage uh, stress and trauma reminders and loss. This is what the screener looks like. We do standardized psychological health screening. We screen for behavioral, uh, internalizing, externalizing symptoms, depression, anxiety, uh, suicide risk. And these are some of the reports that you, the parent can get uh, that helps guide what they can do to support their child. But also, uh, we have, this comes back to the provider in real time, so that when they sit down for the first time with the kid and the family, they already have customized developmental guidance and psychoeducation to review for them based on their screening profile. This is the timeline, the narrative timeline that um, I told you about already. This is a family who went through a severe uh, car accident. Uh, right before the accident occurred, they were rear-ended at a traffic stop by a large semi-truck. But right before that occurred, there was an argument between the daughters in the family and the older girl bugged her little sister and got her to switch seats. So the little sister was in the very back of the family's uh, minivan or SUV that had a back seat. And she uh, was crushed in that. She, she ended up in the ICU uh, for some time. She was really seriously injured. And the mother was injured too, that the point of, of the accident, the dad went with the injured sister the older sister and a little brother were left for a neighbor to come pick them up an hour later, and mom was taken away by an ambulance to a separate hospital. So you can think back about those predictive risk factors. A lot of them happened uh, to this family uh, at the time of the accident. And when they came to us, the older daughter had tons of separation anxiety. The middle daughter had become quite depressed. Mom was uh, not moving forward with a surgery that she needed because uh, she felt that she couldn't leave her family because of all the anxiety in it. So this was the parents' reflection on what had happened, the points of greatest difficulty for them. A lot of it had to do with their helplessness about being able to protect their child. Dad couldn't get out of his seatbelt. Mom was taken away, and you can see the ups and downs that they track against a feeling thermometer on the side. This is a key emotional regulation tool for us, and it becomes part of the vocabulary that the families use to talk about their stress level. They're in the green, they're in the yellow, the orange, and the red. They learn how to recognize this in themselves and others, and start to learn coping skills to get back to the green, and you'll hear about that in just one minute. So I'm not, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I wanted to give you a visual. Children make a map. They usually do pictures or collages. If they're kids who like to talk, uh, they can still map the words to uh, essentially kind of a, a candy line a timeline that they go through. And, and they, they look at key points. Some of them may be uh, difficult aspects of what they went through, but some of them may be good things too. And then they get all the way up to kind of current events and reflecting back on the last month and where they are now. And this, this timeline reflected the girls coming together in the family session and being able to talk about this argument and the flipping of seats and the older daughter sharing her sense of responsibility and the younger one saying, it wasn't your fault, it was that guy driving the car behind us. He's the one who did this. So it's like really important moments to clarify misunderstandings in the family. So these are um, children in, in India actually looking at a feeling thermometer and learning some emotional regulation skills. But this, as I said, it becomes a tool that, they, that the family uses to really link a whole host of other skill sets too. So 
This is a mom talking about how learning about emotional awareness and emotional regulation has been important for her family. The thermometer helped us a lot because we were able to see, oh, we're operating the red zone way too often. It's exhausting us. And we can be calmer and you know, make things a lot easier at home. Um, the other thing we used a lot was the feeling foxes and talking about everything we did every day and how we felt every day. And I noticed for myself that every day I was writing, I'm really tired. <laughs> and I was like, that's not right. That's to be how it is every day that I'm exhausted. And so I really started thinking about what I could do to be less tired. So you can see how she's using the tool to reflect on her own, where she is, where her kids are, and all the families pick up on this color-coded language, which, sound, which sounds really concrete and simple, but it, become, it becomes embedded in their discussions about feeling states and where they are. A child can see when his mom's in the red and say, hey, mom, maybe we should talk about this later. <laughs> You're in the red right now. This, you know, this becomes this everyday tool that families use. They put the thermometer on their refrigerator. They do check-ins around it. This is a set of what we call getting to green activities. We help people develop their own personalized inventories. These are just suggestions. But here, again, the same mom talking about how they use uh, this thinking. So I said, when we get home, I hope we can reboot. And that turned everything around like immediately. And so it was that moment of, oh, we don't have to be like this. We can get to green, and we can have still a really nice day. And so we did that, and it was just, I mean, it was within a minute that the whole climate changed and we were able to get to green. We had a super fun day. And so I think that's really a skill that we learned at Focus is to be able to just, let's turn this thing off that we don't like and let's turn on something that we do want and that is a goal and a priority for our family to enjoy each other's company and be together. So you can hear in that they've set goals as a family. To, they had the priority to enjoy each other's company. That was their goal. They had learned some skills about problem solving and then uh, some tools to get back to the green. So she's communicating the, the output of, of a lot of different elements of the intervention. This is really important in managing uh, traumatic reminders. A lot of our kids uh, who come to UCLA, particularly for chronic medical conditions, they may have a reminder rounding the corner uh, into Westwood. They may deal with a reminder with their medications every single day. Um, I, you know, it may be the smell of insulin. It may be the way the medications look. And these things can interfere with their adherence to care. It can interfere with them coming in for treatment, and it can certainly interfere with their long-term outcomes. And there's been some nice studies done in transplant populations uh, showing some of these direct pathways. So what we do is, linking it to the thermometer, we teach them to track what these reminders are, the triggers to these reactions that they feel so out of control when they happen, and then they can develop a specific plan. It could be simple, uh, but it, they have a plan and they can anticipate and regulate more effectively and they can use each other as a family. A child may simply need to hold a parent's hand. Uh, they may have a little signal to their parent of what can be done to comfort them when they know they're going to become reactive because obviously they can't not come in uh, for treatment or care. This is about the same mom talking about goal setting and how they did this as a family. And I, I think it's helpful to hear from patients, not just from me. So Talking about our goals and making our vision board was really good. And we still, when we went home that day, my husband took a great big um, thumbtack and nailed that thing into the back of our front door. And it's still there. So anytime we go out the front door, we're seeing our vision board. And you know, I often stop and think about, who put that on there? What was that? What did that mean and stuff? So we still, you know, it helped give our family hope for the future. Is really what it did. It gave us a um, kind of direction and that there were better days to come because sometimes it really didn't feel like we knew how to make it better. And so I think knowing that there was a way, you know, there were better days to come. There was things to hope for for the future. We had control over what our family was going to be going forward. 
so again, this, there's setting goals, there's hopefulness, this is strength-based. The vision board she's referring to was kind of a shared uh, family narrative that they put together. So just, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I see my time is, is uh, ticking, but I wanna share with you some of the outcomes. We have parent behavioral health and child behavioral health outcomes. Uh, we show that kids, this is in a military population, again, a highly stressed population uh, with thousands of parents, really showing about a quarter come in at risk for depression and anxiety, and then following the intervention and sustained over time, uh, about a 50% reduction in those screening at risk. Kids, uh, even a more dramatic, now they come in more, more symptomatic in terms of internalizing and externalizing symptoms, and you see a big reduction in their prevalence uh, risk screen, of risk screening uh, from pre to post, and then sustained over time uh, in a longitudinal follow-up and an improvement in their pro-social behaviors. Uh, we've integrated these concepts across a number of settings, including community and school-based groups, uh, now with uh, uh, professional development and training for couples with uh, very young children. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the technology tools, because these are things that are free and available and that could actually be integrated into your care practices. We have a focus app uh, that it has games uh, teaching and reinforcing some of these emotional regulation skills and problem solving skills, and a comic creator that helps a kid uh, make their own narrative. We also have resources for parents embedded in this, and a res well, and also they can do the resilience screener as part of it and get personalized feedback through the app. Uh, this is the bear, I, I won't spend time on these, but this is the. Uh, bear catching coping skills and bringing his feeling thermometer back to the green. Um, this is a word search for feeling identification words and then they toss them into the area on the thermometer where they feel that uh, particular emotion. This is a comic creator they can make they can use pre-done templates or make their own, and we've, we have kids really engage with this, particularly uh, five to 12-year-old kids really like these games. There's actually a multi-level game where they um, uh, problem solve and then build a whole cave environment in it. We've started doing a lot of uh, tele-delivery because we find that a lot of our families have difficulty driving and parking and coming to UCLA for behavioral health care, but also there's a, a number of other settings where families live at big geographic distances. So we've developed and implemented and are currently doing a randomized trial of a VTC, what we call virtual home visiting version of the model for families with early, very young kids. This is just manuals that support it. And then applications here. I want to talk a little bit about the need for integrated behavioral health in primary care settings here. The Affordable Care Act certainly has uh, given us a great opportunity. Um, now there uh, is increased recognition that comorbid uh, health and behavioral health problems uh, create a a large burden when you run a capitated system. These are high utilizers, uh, people who could be more effectively managed. And now there's a wealth of literature to suggest that integrated behavioral health and collaborative care models have a significant impact on both mental health and health outcomes for uh, children and adults. So I think this is, we, we are viewing this as a, a great opportunity. Our colleague, Dr. Mark Grossman, who many of you may know, uh, has implemented the beginnings of a collaborative care model uh, within the uh, CPN and Behavioral Health Associates, both for adults and for children in the clinic network. <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit about that model. But the principles of collaborative care is that the team works together, both mental health and health. They use a shared care plan. Uh, they use a registry to track behavioral health outcomes, and they treat to target using evidence-based um, practices. So it's essentially measurement-based care. And 
providers are accountable and reimbursed for the quality of care in its optimally implemented setting. Um, since it's been implemented within behavioral health associates for adults here at UCLA, we've seen a significant reduction in ER visits uh, for the comorbid patients in those systems. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, but we can have a much greater understanding of how this could be implemented within pediatrics here. Uh, this is uh, the behavioral health network. As I just described it, uh, behavioral health providers, both psychiatrists and master's level therapists, are co-located within clinics, both for children and for adults. There's individual family and group therapy. We've trained them in the focus model. There's an e-consultation system that they've launched this year. And they've actually also are building an external network of behavioral health providers. Uh, this is the conceptualization of it. The care team includes both paraprofessionals to extend care, the primary care provider and the psychiatrist all working together. Uh, and it's most effectively done if there's a care coordinator assigned to the patient uh, screening at risk. <clears throat> There's an opportunity to do uh, 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 web-based CBT. Uh, now there's lots of great CBT programs for anxiety and depression. And if, if we have an integrated system and can identify people at mid, a low to moderate depression and anxiety, we can of, often serve them effectively through participation in an online practice. Um, reducing the burden on the workforce. Because as you know, from probably from trying to refer uh, kids to mental health providers, this is a huge problem uh, in our care system. There aren't enough providers. There are not enough child psychiatrists. The reimbursement structure has been confusing. Uh, you're, you know, it, depending on the insurance your patient has, there's an array of barriers. And we have long waiting lists. The Department of Psychiatry has waiting lists in all of its child clinics. Um, so one of the tools that we've taken from the large implementation of FOCUS is that screening tool that I showed you, and we've implemented it in collaboration with Dr. Grossman in Behavioral Health Associates. Uh, so we can have uh, the ability both to personalize care and create a registry to track and treat to target an essential component of collaborative care. This is what it looks like when a patient comes in, I guess this is a grandmom, comes into uh, the care clinic and the child can do it or the parent does it. Uh, it's screening of family functioning as well as child uh, mental health risk and child coping. This is a report that's immediately scored, interpreted, and clinical guidance is given and sent to the behavioral health provider uh, at the very first visit. So you, already care is being shaped and customized. This is what the report the provider in Behavioral Health Associates gets on their phone. It's much longer than this, but this is just a piece of it. There's flagging and there's some specific tools uh, that are recommended. And this is just to give you a sense of the flow of treatment to target. This is based on depression screening. Uh, the kid comes into primary care, is screened perhaps with the PHQ for depression. They screen at risk. They're referred. They're either, there's a, a, a set of algorithms and protocols. Some of that can be managed in primary care, some in consultation with a psychiatrist. And this is how ideally it goes. And these are the elements I was talking about, but all the way from sort of a traditional uh, low, lower risk uh, screening uh, to preventative interventions, online tools, uh, into individual therapy and medication. And for those kids who are chronic and have uh, long-term mental health needs, those are the ones who ideally would be managing kind of a TQ model here within the Department of Psychiatry or uh, in whatever network where you build in uh, more intensive care services. Just a few words about the STAR clinic. It was mentioned earlier. Uh, we work with kids facing stress, trauma, and adversity. About half our patients are uh, pe really pediatric medical trauma cases, um, both from transplant, hemonc, injury cases, et cetera. 
We do an array of evidence-based practices, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, parent-child interactional therapy, a really wonderful model for young kids with behavioral problems or, and or who've been exposed to trauma and are having a great deal of uh, dysregulation. Uh, we've also, in the last year and a half, launched two embedded care pilots within uh, Hemon Clinics in, in uh, coordination with Jackie Casillas um, and in the Pediatric Heart Transplant Clinic with Dr. Alejos. And the idea there, again, is to screen at a family level, not just screen the child, but in, we have a mental health provider become part of the multidisciplinary care team and the regular workflow in the clinic, they do this tablet-based screening of both parents and kids and are able to identify those at risk early. This is a big uh, goal of Dr. Alejos was to identify families who were gonna have more difficulty early on, even before uh, they went through a transplant. Uh, this, and this has been, I think, quite effective. We have, uh, I don't have the early data to present, but I, hope, I will uh, hopefully in the next six months or so. We've also included pediatric residents in our training program. We love having them there. They bring a, a, a wealth of knowledge about our patients. They often know the patients and uh, who we're seeing in clinic and are able to observe and, be and become part of our multidisciplinary team. I just described a lot of what uh, the components of, the, of what the embedded care process does. So I just a couple words before I end about the new Division of Population Behavioral Health in uh, Psychiatry. As Jessica said, I'm the, I'm the director of that new division, and I'm doing that with uh, Dr. Jessica Jeffrey, and Dr. Birch is part of our affiliated faculty. Uh, and we did this really in collaboration uh, with some of the primary care teams in UCLA Health Leadership. And the idea was to bring uh, a consultation research process around embedding behavioral health practices to develop a behavioral health training institute, both online and in person, that could support these practices, as well as specific training in evidence-based uh, 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 interventions, and then also um, to really uh, bring a lot of the research we've been doing in other settings, bring it in under an umbrella to consolidate some of our uh, resources and thinking and develop expertise. We also have a big emphasis on uh, technology platforms and this screening platform uh, that we would like to work in disseminating across the system. <clears throat> I just described what we're doing in the Training Institute, and I think one of the first uh, key efforts is the professional well-being resilience training uh, that Drs. Lloyd and Birch are doing with pediatric residents, and we really look forward to that. The curriculum looks wonderful, and I know there's been great participation by um, the pediatric faculty as well. It's to acknowledge uh, uh, funders from a number of sources, both philanthropic and research, as well as our service delivery funding. And this is our website. You can download our apps for free on, on the various platforms. We also have an adaptation of the app for foster youth, for tra transitional age foster youth and their families that we've done. And I like to end with a picture. And this is a little girl drew this. Her father was injured, uh, and they could no longer um, do their surf together, which he had taught her how to do. And so she was, she, her wish was to be able to do things more closely with her father, and that had been difficult. But I think it really captures this notion that kids don't, don't live in isolation, they live in a system. And that if we really want to support them and attend to them, we have to cherish and attend to their parents, and I would broaden it to their whole family system as well. So thank you. <laughs>